Um, as for our um, wonderful speaker, Dr. Dario, which I have been honored to have his friendship for many, many years, and he is one of our foremost uh, authorities on the ancient um, Persian history. Uh, Dr. Dario is a Howard C. Baskerville professor in the history of Iran and Persianite world and the Associate Director at, at the Dr. Samuel M. Jordan Center for Persian Studies and Culture uh, and School of Humanities at the University of California in Irvine. He was born in Tehran and he gave me his birthday in 1967 and uh, he finished his elementary and secondary schools uh, in Tehran, in uh, Athens, Greece, and then later on he moved to the uh, United States. Uh, he got his PhD in history from the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA, in 1999, and he specializes in the history and uh, culture of ancient Persia. Uh, he is the editor of the International Journal of Ancient Iranian Studies, which is a big deal for some of you that you don't know. And his two most recent books are Sasanian Persia, The Rise and Fall of an Empire, um, which is an IB Taurus from London and uh, in conjunction with Dr. Iraj Afshar, again, very well known within the Iranian community. And his other books are Scholars and Humanists, Iranian Studies in the Letters of S.H. Tarizadeh and W.B. Henning in Costa Mesa. He, his forthcoming book is uh, coming from Oxford uh, History of Iran in 2010. So I would like for you to welcome Dr. Daryoyi, and we are um, very enthusiastically waiting to hear your lecture today. Thank you so very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Bowers Museum. I'd like to thank Nancy Warza Brady, uh, the Vice President of Education of the Bowers Museum, as well as uh, Mariam Molavi, uh, my friend, my dear friend, uh, who is in charge of the Persian Arts Council, uh, for bringing uh, me here and giving us an opportunity on behalf of the Center for Persian Studies. And Dr. Rahimia, who's the director, is also here. Uh, to interact outside of uh, the university per se. And I look at this as part of our uh, service to the community, but of course within the museum, which is a great opportunity to talk about, uh, well, as you see the title, From China to Iran to Rome, uh, in a sense this in-between culture that sometimes gets, uh, not, well, you would say not noticed as opposed to this uh, very important Chinese civilization and the Roman Empire, where we hear about very much. And I think this Silk Road exhibition uh, does show us that this, there is all these elements involved in what we call uh, the Silk Road. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's start our lecture. What we call the Silk Road, of course, is rather a modern construction. Uh, it is really a late 18th century idea by Europeans where they imagined a road that begins in China and ends up in the on the Mediterranean. Uh, there is no specifically a Silk Road, but I think conceptually we can imagine that there are a group of people who have varied religions, very interestingly, interacting with each other, trading with each other. That is the idea of a, um, almost an international commerce at least it is nothing new. Already uh, in the first millennium, uh, uh, we do have a sort of Eurasian trade uh, certainly going on. And it's this trade that brings people into contact and also ideas and also the borrowing of religions. Now, it happens that also Europeans were interested in the discovery of these traditions and whatnot. Uh, I think first and foremost is Sir Ariel Stein, who's I think right here, a Hungarian who took it upon himself to travel several times uh, through what we call the Silk Road. And so if you want to have this road, this is actually the route of uh, Ariel Stein's travel back and forth several times uh, to look for uh, manuscripts, texts, and traditions. And I think what is of interest for us is this oasis right here, where we find the Turfan uh, and the Tunhuang, but mainly Turfan where uh, Stein visits and is hosted by a Taoist monk. Uh, and he stays there the first time he's there. And uh, 
Tufan is an oasis. It's about 30 meters below sea level. Uh, it is a fertile place. And in fact, it would also store documents very well. Uh, Wang, who is a Taoist monk, gives him a little secret that behind the wall of this monastery, there are some manuscripts. And he's able to see it. And he's just exhilarated when he sees these. But he never gets really access to it the first time. But the second time he comes back, he, uh, he becomes you know, closer to Wang, and he's actually able to purchase some of these uh, manuscripts. And behind the wall, and here's actually Turfan again on the map in Western China today, if you're looking at that, right? This is the Urumqi, where the, uh, you know, also mummies came about. And we have some, uh, of course, mummies here in the exhibition. Here's a modern mosque uh, in Turfan today, so that tells us about the movement of religions uh, in the first millennium. And what happens is, uh, there are about 30,000 scrolls, about 30,000 texts. And I should say that most of them still wait to be translated and worked on for us to get a better understanding of these various people who were traveling on the Silk Road to see what they were doing, uh, what they believed in. Because we do get ideas about people we'll talk about today, the Manichaeans and others be a, perhaps hostile sources or sources that were far away from this oasis of Turfan. Why is it difficult? Well, they just happen to be in various languages and scripts. Uh, just to give you several of these, uh, you have uh, texts in Sanskrit, in Manichaean, which is a religious tradition, Turkish, uh, Uyghur, Brahmi, Tibetan, Parthian, Middle Persian and Sogdian. I should mention that, of course, uh, this last one will be something of our interest in this talk, as we uh, find these people who speak the Sogdian language are very good merchants. And by the way, they speak an Iranian language, uh, all the way in Western China, of what is modern day Western China. So these texts are found, and uh, some of them are in Germany, some of them are again scattered throughout the world, and people are working on them. But these texts really open up, at least they have opened up in the past century, ideas about what was going on in terms of these trade beliefs on what we call this Silk Road. And now moving away from our conception of uh, a Silk Road, perhaps to the first millennium or actually the first century BC and whatnot, uh, we should go all the way to the east, to China. And in fact, Han China is an important reason for this contact. Uh, it is the Chinese who have developed very interesting things uh, all the way in the East, uh, that in time, by the 7th and 8th century, certainly gets to the Middle East and further west to Europe. Uh, one of the important inventions, of course, is paper. That is something that is quite important and revolutionizes and changes, actually. I think literacy and uh, the idea of the book uh, for the Middle East, by the 8th century, uh, the people in the Middle East have been introduced to it. The Muslims are going to take it to the West, and it's going to be adopted there. Uh, so again, uh, it's this Han China, and again, somehow it has this prong looking we uh, westward, uh, that brings this curiosity about uh, the West and what is going on in the West. And what we have is a nice tale, perhaps, uh, again, we're not sure how accurate it is, that in the second century BC, Zhang Jian, uh, an ambassador by the Han Emperor is sent to the West. Where? To the Arsacid court, or the Parthians, they were either known as the Parthians or the Arsacids, uh, to make some sort of a contact. Now, why would the Chinese Emperor, Wu Di, be interested in what is going on in Parthia, that is further west? And there is the coinage, by the way, of Mithridates, King Mithridates II, uh, the Parthian ruler. So we have this moment of uh, Chinese-Iranian contact, uh, at least a reference to it, from the second century BC. The reason why Woody may be interested is told through Chinese sources themselves. Uh, the first and foremost historian of ancient China is Sima Qian, uh, who died about 90 BC, so about first century uh, BC. And he gives us a passage in his Shiji historical memoirs in chapter 23, 